Good day, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our side event on the entitled On the Front Lines, the Indigenous Women Defending Their Lands and the Environment. This side event is organized by the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International, the Asia Indigenous Peoples' Network on Extractive Industries and Energy, and the Asia Indigenous Peoples' PAC. Um, I'm Roby Halip. I am with the right uh, energy partnership with Indigenous peoples from the Kalanguyan Kankana Indigenous group in the Philippines. Now, this side event, um, we'll be presenting stories of Indigenous leaders, particularly experiences of Indigenous women human rights uh, defenders in their struggle to defend their land and uh, resources. We have speakers from Cambodia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and the Philippines. And we are also lucky to have here um, one of the working group members in uh, the Business and Human Rights and also a representative from UNEP who will also be talking about their work on environmental human rights um, defenders. Now to start, um, now to start the discussion, we'd like to call on um, Dr. Pichamon Yopantong. She is the new member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights uh, for Asia and also the vice um, chairperson. She will be walking us through the UN guiding principles and also the complaints mechanism of the working group on how um, Indigenous peoples can make use of this for the redress of their grievances. So Dr. Pichamon, is yours. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me clearly on the other side. Um, and really, thank you so much for this opportunity to be a part of this really important side event. Um, it is, we heard earlier today from Joyce, of course, about the importance of ensuring that the rights of Indigenous peoples are recognized and also celebrated. Um, at the same time, we, of course, have to acknowledge the fact that the rights of Indigenous peoples, as well as their contributions, currently aren't being recognized and celebrated as they ought to be. Um, part of the challenge with respect to implementing voluntary guidelines and frameworks like the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights really is about taking into consideration those intersectionality concerns. Um, and of course, again, women Indigenous uh, human rights uh, defenders are particularly susceptible to that given the intersectional experiences that they have to experience when fighting for their rights uh, as well as for their community's rights. Um, so on that note, uh, please allow me to um, provide you with a brief introduction to the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. We have a much longer name, but we really do go by the Business and Human Rights name rather than the other one. Um, the UN Working Group was established uh, when the Human Rights Council um, decided to approve the mandate um, for Business and Human Rights back in 2011. Um, and since then, it's been a real uh, journey in terms of growing the adoption and implementation of the UN Guiding Principles uh, globally, regionally, as well as nationally. Um, the mandate of the UN uh, Working Group is really to disseminate, promote, as well as implement the Guiding Principles and to assist stakeholders, whether they be uh, civil society, businesses, or states, um, to better understand what is required and how this implementation ought to proceed. Um, as part of the UN guiding principles itself, because by nature they're not voluntary, people often, of course, raise that concern. How can we ensure that states and businesses are abiding by their responsibilities and obligations as set out in the guiding principles? And whilst those concerns are very much justified, we also have to bear in mind that the guiding principles themselves are very much based upon um, observed and accepted international human rights legal obligations for both states as well as businesses. Um, with respect to how the UN guiding principles are relevant to Indigenous peoples and their rights, um, I have to admit right, that the document of the UN guiding principles itself does not explicitly um, or extensively talk about Indigenous peoples. And that is certainly an issue. Um, the fact of the matter was that the guiding principles were developed as a generic, in one sense, a generic set of guiding principles. Um, so they can't 
really kind of on paper be able to take into account all of the unique and diverse experiences that Indigenous peoples, as well as human rights defenders more broadly, experience um, when working in the field. That being said, um, it does mean that there's so much more that we have to do in this space. It means that we have to think more carefully about how the guiding principles are meant to be applied um, and how they should take into consideration uh, the experiences as well as the unique challenges faced by Indigenous peoples, especially women Indigenous human rights defenders. Um, as part of our roadmap that we had conducted um, not too long ago in order to stop take, uh, to what extent we've been able to achieve the objectives of the, of the guiding principles, we did take note, explicit note, of the importance of Indigenous peoples as stakeholders that need to be afforded protection, but also respect for their, again, integral role in ensuring that business and human rights is on the agenda for a lot of the states in this region. Um, we are currently in a process where we are thinking about what the next steps are in terms of putting the roadmap into practice. And again, this is where these types of events are very valuable to us as working group members as well, because it provides us with insight into what you are facing and how we can do better in order to um, provide support as well as um, other resources uh, in, your, in your work. Um, so on that note, I know that I don't have too much time, so let me jump into the submission of information mechanism. Uh, this is a mechanism that exists at the level of the UN Special Procedures. Um, I know that people here and elsewhere have been referring it to, to it more colloquially as a complaints mechanism. Uh, in one sense, it does operate in that way, in the sense that if you do have any allegations of business-related human rights violations, uh, you are very welcome to submit information through the portal that's available on the UN Special Procedures web webpage, um, and that will get sent to us if you uh, nominate us as a lead mandate or any of the other special rapporteurs. We have special rapporteurs working on human rights defenders, as well as on you know, toxic pollution, environment, and so forth, um, as well as, of course, indigenous uh, rights. Um, so in light of that, it is a really useful tool. Um, it nonetheless does require a lot of effort um, into compiling and writing up those submissions. Uh, we do require that the submissions be made in a UN uh, language. Um, so normally a lot of the submissions we receive will be in English. I understand that that does create barriers um, in terms of language as well as complexity. And so what I would encourage people here to do is to reach out to your local OHCHR office. Um, they normally are very willing, very ready to help uh, with compiling a submission through the UN Special Procedures Mechanism. Um, aside from that, if you do have any further questions about this mechanism, please feel free to reach out to the working group. Uh, my details are available online, but I also have my colleagues here from the Secretariat who would also be more than willing to lend assistance if you do have any further questions. And the one last thing I will note is that um, in terms of the submission of information, the UN Working Group has the expertise within special procedures uh, to write letters to um, letters of allegation to, to businesses. Um, and so this is where our value added is, and this is where we are very keen uh, to contribute um, to the submissions and to the uh, investigations when it comes to these allegations. But I'll stop there. If you do have any further questions, please feel free to, to shoot them through the chat box, or um, I'll be happy for you to reach out to me later as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Pete Shaman. And if you have questions, we'll be opening up for question and answer later. But it's good to know about the complaints mechanism as, as it put uh, it puts some teeth no, on the implementation of the UN guiding principles, because we know that a lot of business uh, operations are happening in indigenous territories without our free, fire, and informed um, consent. Not a lot of human rights violations are happening in our territories. And uh, this is one thing where access to remedy has been very, very one thing. Um, indigenous peoples try to access legal courts. Indigenous peoples try to submit to special procedures like uh, to the special offer tour on, on the rights of indigenous peoples. But in terms of holding corporations accountable, it's been difficult. So um, as the working group also develops its roadmap, um, I think regional, uh, it 
uh, studies that you would be hearing from here would be part of the studies coming from um, the regional perspective of indigenous peoples and dedicated consultations with indigenous peoples on business and human rights would really help for you to um, for you to build the roadmap integrating the specific needs and the distinctiveness of, of uh, indigenous peoples, human rights defenders. Now to tell us stories from the ground, uh, we have uh, Sri Mam Chun here from Cambodia. She's an indigenous, uh, Bunong indigenous woman from Cambodia with the Cambodia Indigenous Women uh, Association. And she will be talking in Khmer. Uh, so if I could request everyone to speak to the English channel so that uh, she could share her story. She, she experienced direct criminalization on no? the defense of their uh, collective land rights in Cambodia. So stream on, you can. Sorry. I am uh, Srey Mom. I belong to Bonong Indigenous. I'm from uh, Stang Trang province. I am a representative of the Cambodian Indigenous Youth uh, uh, Women Association. That uh, the first uh, platform, first platform for the women in Cambodia. It's a great honor for me to share, especially myself, to say about the situation. Of, uh, the concern of the indigenous women in Cambodia. I am from the affected community in Kabarmi. Uh, most of us are Bunong in the northern part of Cambodia. Uh, we live along the Sisan River. Uh, the river that was uh, <coughs> built, the lower Sisan too. Uh, the dam was joined when and ventured by the Vietnamese company, uh, Cambodian and other Chinese. It affects to indigenous people. It uh, affected to indigenous community along the Sesan River. The more affected community are indigenous people. Currently, we are still facing the uh, the challenge and uh, our area is were, uh, flooded. We try our best to uh, claim our rights through our submission. Uh, the request, the petition to relevant agency, especially also the uh, finance agency. While we try to demand our mostly we reject by them. This is where I sharing that where we are living. Uh, we have the population is 225 people there. Our living is uh, depend on the natural resource very peacefully. We practice our uh, traditional way of life, uh, fishing, assessing to non timber forest product from our forest and also uh, applying the system cultivation. When the dam projects come in, all those things was uh, destroyed, the secret side that you see this uh, practice was uh, plotted by the lower system to them. This is the dam. It's already uh, built in 2018. Uh, some people, some affected community, they accept the compensation. But for us, 
225 people uh, reject the compensation and we decide to stay there. So we try uh, to claim our right to demand to the government to get the resolution uh, because we want, don't want to leave our place. We try to uh, organize so many uh, event, traditional event, and also uh, to raise our boy out. No solution at all. They try to put pressure. Uh, they uh, take out all the public service. They abuse us again, the, uh, the government, again, the state. Uh, the people, they don't understand about the development uh, purpose because they said that the development always uh, have some challenge effect, but uh, the development is for the, the country. So without our consent, it's uh, always affect to our life, our right to culture, to believe. The project start uh, since 2007. We have organized so many uh, uh, event uh, program to raise our voice, but the government also have so many strategy to put pressure to us. And they take out the education, the school was closed. So you can see the picture that we organize of a big gathering, a cultural uh, event uh, to inform to our spirit. Uh, that we are, we leave the village. So this event is before like only few weeks before the village was uh, flooded. We decide to move from our old village to the new one, but since not the new place, it also uh, belong to us. When we organize this event, the government, they put a lot of the uh, armed force along the way. They try to threat us. They inform us that uh, if we still continue to stay there, it will be dangerous because this place will be flooded. After we organize our traditional uh, event, uh, the provincial court accused us ex some uh, our. Um, We try to raise our voice to the government on behalf of community. So we were accused. Yeah. This is uh, injustice for us. We already uh, faced the problem by the dam and they still use the criminal court to abuse us. So this is the our old village. You can see the picture. This is the, the bad history for us. So we don't want to uh, to remove our house. We keep we keep to show the evidence. This is the new place, the new uh, settlement of us. We move from the old village to here. So we are living here right now. We rebuild our house by our own. The local authority support only uh, the school, the health center, and rebuild the, the construct the, the, the road. But the compensation have not yet uh, discussed. 
since we face the problem until uh, we has no uh, attention and support from the government. So this, while we are facing the problem, we also try to promote our culture through building the cultural center. And also we, uh, we also struggle to get the communal land title to the issue of our land. So the reason that we've tried to secure our land is not just for our people there it for 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 the for the world because the existing forest is still big we demand uh, 8000 hectare uh, we demand for two kind of land individual uh, private land and uh, public land to secure so we not demand for just using the land to destroy the land we demand to conserve the land. We demand to the government to pay attention to respect our rights because we demand for conservation so not to destroy the land. But they send, they support other company named Chuge. The Chinese company got a license uh, to develop, to plant the banana, a rubber tree. This is the picture of the government. They come without the, apply the pre pro informed consent. We don't know about this. They just come, they they brought the, the armed force. So this is the picture that the Chinese companies can destroy the forest and do the illegal logging. We keep continue to demand to them, don't continue to destroy the forest and provide us the land tenors. But the government, especially the local authority, they never pay attention to what we have demand. This is what we are facing right now. Currently, the company is trying to destroy uh, day and night to destroy the forest. You can see the illegal logging. Yeah, this is close to the uh, to the dam, uh, <coughs> it's our destroy our secret site. And it's my case in the code, they still not yet drop. And we still continue <coughs> to the, uh, to the code. The reason that they accuse us because they want to put the pressure to, to us, to my family, uh, the leader of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raymond, for sharing the experience of Cambodia. No, it's been a double whammy for them. They were affected by the lower sand to them. They were displaced. And you would see there the connection. Is there anyone? You would see there um, the connection they have with their land when they conducted the ritual to um, tell the spirits of their ancestors that they are living and they are moving to a new land. So land for indigenous peoples, as she has uh, presented a while ago, is not just our source of livelihood, but also we have deep interconnectedness in terms of our identity as indigenous peoples. And displacement, destruction of our sacred sites has a very big impact to our identity as indigenous peoples. And now they're also faced with the issue of plantation. 
where they were in the land where they were resettled, there's a plantation coming in. And cases that were filed against them has not yet been dropped as um, probably as a tool to repress um, these community leaders, these indigenous women, human rights defenders from defending what's left of their land and, and resources. Um, so we, we move on from Cambodia. So it's not only in Cambodia where this is being experienced no, on, on the criminalization, loss of land, loss of livelihood. But also in Indonesia, we've been hearing a lot of this uh, criminalization and human rights violations against indigenous peoples. And we have, oh, before Indonesia, we moved to the Philippines first to talk about uh, the mining in the Philippines. No? Uh, we know that mining has again opened up, mining operations has again opened up in the Philippines, and it's a very big problem for indigenous peoples. The conduct, we have a law on indigenous peoples recognizing our right to free prior and informed consent, but the implementation has been very, very problematic. And we have Rendilin Puyok here of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Network on Extractive Industries and Energy to share the experience on extractive industries and the role of Indigenous women in the struggle of the community. Randalyn. Thank you, Ruby. My name is Rans and I'm from the Philippines. I belong to the uh, Tuali Igorot tribe. So my part today is to share with you um, our experience when it comes to defense of ancestral land and environmental defense um, and the pivotal role of women as land rights defenders and human rights activists. Um, I don't have anything to show on screen, but I have a lot to say. So if you know from these um, experiences comes a profound understanding of the interplay of state policies and business interests and how it most often than not is contrary to upholding it's, indigenous rights to land and- no doubt for the interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And self-determination, I apologize, okay. Let's see, <laughs> it happened to me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, okay. So this is the case with um, energy projects or mining uh, operations in our region, but to try and concretize um, the situation for everybody. The region where I come from, the Cordillera hosts um, several river systems and a really large deposit, um, mineral deposit, um, according to one of the uh, investors or the foreign companies interested to um, develop um, the area. It has, it has the potential for uh, to be developed into a world class Copper porphyry project. So that is the potential or the uh, the uh, mineral deposit that we have or that we host in um, the region. So the mining tenements cover hundreds of um, hectares of our land, ancestral domain, including agricultural lands, the communities, and of course um, forests. So knowing the detrimental impact of these um, projects to our lives and our livelihood as indigenous peoples, these were met with fierce resistance from. Um, from the communities, the impact communities. So we initiate direct actions such as a show of protest uh, or rejection, even from the early stages of these um, uh, mining applications, uh, like the beginning of the FBIC processes. Um, communities already um, express informally or formally through adopting uh, community resolutions, their rejection to these um, corporate interests uh, coming into their communities. Most often in these initiatives, we find women playing key roles in amplifying these sentiments against the corporate exploitation of natural resources in indigenous territories. So from organizing their communities to mobilizing delegations to lobby in various government agencies and offices, um, submitting petitions, other engagements within the various uh, legal platforms that is accessible to them, um, you are sure to find a woman in, uh, in the midst of it all. If you look around you in this room, it's uh, dominantly women. <laughs> So let me share with you a name and keep that in mind, um, because aside from mining operations, we also have a really big concern when it comes to energy or hydroelectric projects. Um, she's Beatrice Belen, a woman indigenous leader from one of the Kalinga tribes in the Cordillera. She was charged with illegal possession of firearms and explosives um, back in October 2020. Um, her house was raided at dawn and um, evidences were planted and so to justify the, her arbitrary arrest and um, detention. Um, she was in jail for several months while the pandemic was raging in the Philippines. The process utterly ignored, of course. So um, for context, this was a time when red tagging or uh, terrorist tagging, criminalizing of indigenous peoples was rampant in our country. The pandemic was uh, weaponized or rather 
um, it was a great opportunity for them to crack down on indigenous activists uh, protesting um, destructive energy projects and mining operations in their communities because there was a limited uh, mobilization in the communities because of the health protocols in place. So Beatrice Belen was a leading figure in her community's protests and mobilizations against the then Chevron-owned geothermal project in their community, and then later on with the various other um, indigenous Um, lawyers, and so they were able to assist. Um, it was the cases against her were dropped, but her security was uh, already compromised. And while the criminalization of human rights activists is still in practice, of course, um, her life and the likes of her are still in peril because she didn't stop advocating for indigenous people's rights. She still is uh, very active in these advocacies. So our history of resistance as indigenous peoples in the Cordillera, um, our history of resistance to development aggression, like extractive industries and energy, is written largely by women and their actions. So it's not surprising that women are targets of criminalization and human rights violations. And in the context of the Philippines, we're in the legal framework to judicially harass IP or indigenous peoples activists and human rights um, defenders are pretty much in place and actually it's being reinforced with more um, legislations and bureaucratic structures. We have a staggering number of uh, victims of human rights violations with women being at the receiving end of unrelenting state attacks. And most of the time, most in most cases, this um, judicial harassment are in the interest of uh, business pursuits. So examples of such policies uh, being used um, by states and their uh, corporate partners are the executive order number 70 by the former Philippine president Duterte, which created a bureaucratic structure or institution, the National Task Force and Local Communist Arms Conflict, um, which lead in criminalizing or maligning the direct actions that we take as indigenous peoples in defense of our land and our environment. Um, our local justice systems like hijack has become a tool for business interests, um, unfortunately. Indigenous peoples are slapped with trump up charges, just like uh, Ms. Belen, jailed arbitrarily, killed extrajudicially in um, extreme cases. Our communities are harassed and militarized, and this leaves our lands defenseless and open for exploitation. So the big businesses are now guaranteed smooth entry without um, resistance. So that is the reality that we face um, every day. In our CSO focus group, some of us have mentioned about government sleeping with corporations, if you remember that, um, Dr. Yofanto. It is worse than that, um, at least in my country's case, <laughs> because the government in itself has turned into a well-oiled enterprise. And there is no clear delineation between human rights and business interests between social services and corporate profit. Um, when political dynasties, which is a very, um, Real thing in the Philippines. The political, uh, political dynasties control and consolidated significant political power. They make use of that, of their position to advance their business interests and we stand at the losing end. So to cap it all, um, if I may put forward some of the recommendations, um, of our recommendations for these issues raised, there are actually, these are actually more of challenges not only to the UN bodies, but um, to all of us as CSOs, indigenous peoples, um, activists, human rights defenders, First to the business or corporate sector, if there is anyone in the room or in this session, pull out from our communities and show some integrity in adhering to legal procedures like the FBIC. Communities have repeatedly expressed their rejection or repulsion to the presence, uh, to your presence, the communities. So pull out. I'm not sure if there's anyone listening to that, but yes, let me just put it out there. Um, now to the working group on business and human rights through Dr. Pichamon Pantong. We need reinforcement in pushing for um, the review of state policies towards revision or total recall of provisions or legal frameworks, um, legislations that are used to judicially harass indigenous peoples or indigenous land rights defenders, like the Executive Order 70 in our case, and the Executive Order 130, this is a new um, administrative order before the former president stepped down, 
Um, this has allowed new mining applications and uh, open pit mining operations in the Philippines as well. So we have to step up our game, especially so that businesses are able to secure state recommendations um, for their corporate projects through state policies. And the UN bodies, I believe, in their capacity can help in relentlessly and aggressively campaigning for these and in amplifying CSO uh, voices. So if the point to all of these is to level out the playing field, more platforms. In fact, every platform available and civic space available should be allowed for the discourse of CSO interests and issues. Um, the businesses have already taken over the states. They have merged with the states in most cases, and the scale is tipped um, in their favor. So we have to step up our game, maybe be bold enough to um, put people and planet over profit. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rance, for sharing you know, that uh, we see here that even during the pandemic, it did not stop business as usual practices or operations of uh, states in the, uh, for, for example, in the Philippines, um, arrests were unrelenting. Um, quarantine protocols were also used for communities in struggle, as in the case of the DPO um, community, the community in the DPO affected by um, Mining has been conducting um, how they call that blockade, and they were they were arrested because of violation to quarantine protocols. And then we have this um, we have this case mentioned by Rance where security laws uh, policies coming out from states are being used to delegitimize uh, um, how they call that dismiss legitimate concerns of indigenous peoples and saying that these are connected to um, how they call terroristic activities in or it's a matter of. Uh, it's a security concern. So um, it's important that while we call for strength and loss and policies in relation to business and human rights, we also call for repeal or review of laws and policies that also step on um, the human rights of the people. So now we continue to, uh, is Banu on board now? Um, she's not so. So okay. So uh, we're now moving to Micheline uh, for the case in Cambodia. We could play the video first. Indonesia. Indonesia. Sorry. Can you play the video? perusahaan masuk ke kini pan itu awal kerja ya kalau awal kerja itu memasuki wilayah adat laman kini itu uh, awal Januari awal Januari 2018 itu mereka mulai masuk mulai, mulai masuk di wilayah adat ya yang pertama yang kami rasakan dampak ini ya dampak ekonomi yang dikriminalisasi kemarin uh, empat ya dengan lima dengan saya harapan kami dengan pemerintah pertama akui uh, wilayah adat kami dan jangan kriminalisasi kami
Right. Thank you very much. Uh, before I speak, I would like to greet my Indonesian friends. Adil Catalino, Bacuramin, Kasaruga, Bak Sengat Kajubata, Arus, Arus, Arus. Mana Sumoraka, Mana Sumoraka in my language, it means is the food ready? It doesn't mean that we are hungry, but we really perceive that food is really important. And as you can see from the video, that most of the people live in Kinipan, which is in Kalimantan, get their food mainly from the forest. And now that the forest is gone, they have no hope to live anymore inside their community. I would like to speak on behalf of the Kinipan community, which right now facing a lot of, of problems. It is not only about the human rights problem, but it is also because of the food crisis and the land crisis that they are facing. As I previously shared yesterday about the story that there has been a lot of palm oil plantation in Indonesia, it also affects the water. So before I came to Bangkok, I visited this uh, community in Kalimantan and I truly felt how the water has changed. It is not fresh anymore and they have no other alternatives to cook or to take a shower unless using that water. And then the current situation right now, there has been a lot of expansions of this palm oil companies because they don't feel it's enough for them. Uh, from the first initial uh, time when they come to survey the Kalimantan Island, it was in the 2012 when the FND Buhing started the fight. Um, they made an agreement with the government that they would only like take 19,000 hectares of the land. But after that, they kept on uh, starving for more and more and more forests to take away. And then up until now, because the Kalimantan Island is already like it's running out of the forest. So now they have plans to move to Papua Island because in Indonesia, we have seven main big islands and there are a lot of sources of forest that, you know, the company can still dig and plant uh, their own uh, mining companies, palm oil plantation and illegal timber businesses. And the thing is that the major effect right now that the indigenous peoples are facing is the civil war and internal conflict between the local communities. Because right now, Kinipan is the only remaining community in Kalimantan that has um, the remaining forest where they can live. And that is why they are very persistent and their, their resistance is very strong right now to um, be, uh, they want and demand the indigenous people's rights to be acknowledged because up until now, the government is not acknowledging us. It is not only in Kinipan, but the whole Indonesia indigenous peoples is not acknowledged. And that is why when we undergo a law enforcement cases, we are not going to be protected because we have no base. We have no legal um, foundation where we can uh, state our condition and situation and the status quo that happening on the ground is really, really bad. And right now the people there are forced to flee their lands, the youth, the women, especially. As you can see in the video, there were uh, there was a head of the village called FND Buhing and William Henke, he is the head of the chief of Kinipan. They were arrested because they were falsely alleged of corruption because they are the company is trying to find toxic things to be alleged to these uh, leaders because they are against this uh, palm oil plantation. And then up until now, um, we are hoping that there will be more uh, practical uh, things or practical solutions that come to the this community because we cannot be hopeful anymore for the government. We have been campaigning for the acknowledgement of the indigenous people's rights where the UNRIP can be adapted, but the government still say no. So right now we want more people, more activists, more of the UN members to come to visit our community directly and then talk to the people directly inside the community. Because other than that, there will be no solutions that is right for the indigenous peoples. You really have to come to see directly what is the reality that they are facing, especially the women, the children. In Indonesia, it's really a, a bad portrayal from the media that we are okay, but we are not. And right now, um, apart from the human rights issue, the local food is also diminishing right now. 
before the Indonesian people not really relying on rice, but I am now <laughs> relying on rice. That is why wherever I go, I need to find rice because actually inside each of the communities, we have our very unique food system in which we have our traditional houses built to keep this food uh, kept safe for hundreds of years and we can still eat it because it is like a you know very unique indigenous traditional system. But now these houses are burned down. Mm -hmm. And the people are forced to left their communities. And we cannot just force the indigenous people like, oh, go to the city. We will give you an alternative to live. And then that's it. Because they are not going to be, you know, adapting to the, you know, strange situation that they are facing. So I agree that in this forum, we would like to see more of a very practical solutions that can solve the problem in Indonesia. In Indonesia, it's not only Kinipan that face this palm oil problems. In Sumatra, in Kalimantan, in Sulawesi, in Papua, there are a lot of, of forests that are now being threatened. And our endemic animals as well, it is being threatened, like the orang utan. We only have few of them already. And we have to like build a fortress specifically for these animals to be kept safe. As you can see that these animals, they have to be free uh, in the forest because they are the one who protect the forest, but now they, we have to protect them because they, they are being threatened by the current situation that we now have. So the thing is that we want to be more open on how the government is running their policy to be more transparent to us that they are actually working with the company because they kept on denying that they are not working with the company, but still they give concessions, they give license to licenses to this company, to the, these small and multinational companies in which they extracted everything from Indonesia and brought it to the Europe just to uh, create good products, but with the risk of the blood of the indigenous peoples. So we don't want this to happen anymore because there will be less of less and less indigenous generations that could kept all of this local wisdom and the food that we have now remaining. And we want to say this to you that in hope that all of these human rights issues can be addressed. So the government and all of the people in Indonesia who support the palm oil plantation can, on, can also realize that they have to stop the illegal uh, mining operations, the timber and palm oil plantations. Because the thing is that we don't need palm oil plantations to live. We don't need the illegal timbers of productions to live. We, we have our own indigenous food. We have our own indigenous system that could make us live um, until our generations can uh, enjoy all of these things. But now indigenous peoples are impacted with the climate crisis and climate change. So we have no hope left unless we have practical solutions. So that would be all that I Resumanga. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Micheline. And um, to know also that Micheline is from the indigenous youth. So it's not just indigenous women, it's not just a wider indigenous community, but indigenous youth are also involved in the struggle for land rights of indigenous peoples. And she highlighted the issue on food security that is corporate um, activities are not only impacting on the human rights uh, of, of indigenous peoples, but also impacting severely on the food sovereignty of indigenous peoples, because even the seed keeping practice is being affected. Now, the granary that she was saying were seeds of generations and generations were destroyed. This affects the food system and the continuing food sovereignty of the um, of the community. So we have, do we now have Banu? Yes. Okay, so we now move to India. Uh, we have Banu Tata. Maybe we can play the video first. Anu, kindly mute yourself first. We play the video and then you will talk. Ne, kube ma ijibula ho, polgeli ngando mbai buho. Ane bahana tena iliki pra iliki pra ne akha na ne ago iliki hagala chimo ho. Nu eswa egala. Ane bahana tena ya pra wida ne nu ali egala po. Eta buge ini kerama ho asia da. Aba em tahombo ashi owe. Ah, toba. De maji de gaba yo ini anti kesha abe ngaba we. Apu ama asito alafa ayuchi angaba topo me ngaja we. 
So I was there in the uh, attended attendees then <laughs> shifted back and I think that yeah a great session everybody thank you Joyce thank you Simo Shimon Shimon and Michelle everybody everybody and also the working group um, Dr Pichamon thank you for attending. So uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I will, looking at the time constraint, I'll try to wrap, wrap up because I, that's why I made the PPT. So I'm Bhanu Pratap, I'm from uh, Arunachal Pradesh, India. So we are this collective anti-dam, uh, anti-dam collective, it's called Dimam Resistance. So I'm gonna talk about uh, what we have been doing and uh, what are the challenges we face. Uh, yeah. So the motto is uh, no more dams and free flowing rivers. So as you can see on the screen, yeah. So uh, so the, the video that you saw was a campaign video. So it was only of a minute. So we make small small clips. So that was of the this uh, the one you can see here, Italian uh, HEP three thousand and ninety seven megawatt. So the picture you see. Uh, is from the Divang uh, multi-purpose dam HEP that is 2,880 megawatt. So if you if you know the history of dams in Arunachal, it's pretty bloody because uh, even monks were shot. You know, a lot of people have not been spared. In the region of Divang Valley alone, there's 15 dams, sorry, 17 dams proposed, and two of these that I mentioned here are world's tallest and largest dams. So the Italian, which if it's passed, it's going to be uh, Asia's uh, largest dam and uh, which is run of the river dam. But the uh, Dibang, which is Dibang multipurpose dam, it's in court because it's uh, basically running on a non-compliance. So the court took the slow motor order of NHPC. So that is where I would also like, uh, want to request you an intervention if that's possible, any government like, you know, you know uh, question why it's still being passed uh, even after being in the court, even after, you know, uh, Having non-compliance, a person a person was shot, you know, during the you know in the whole controversy of anti dam. So and then you know like really like holding these uh, state machineries and also um, the hydropower companies accountable, because without the government enabling them, it's it's not possible the government would you know have so much. Sorry, the companies would have so much like you know in sense audacity to like interfere in decision making where uh, uh, self-determination is quite like established in our areas like it's mostly all predominantly tribal areas so so can we be uh, Valley is also the world's richest biodiversity hotspot so if we go to the next slide i can show you the idea of what i'm talking from there please next slide can i do it yes Banu, do you have a headset? Um, the background noise. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm. Is it is it okay if I put my mic closer? Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, most of the information is also here. So if you see this slide, this is the map of Arunachal Pradesh. So so the, above us is China. So, and then there is uh, Myanmar, uh, this side, then Bangladesh, uh, downstream, and then Assam, there's Bhutan. So this is the map of, uh, it's one of the largest states in Northeast India. So if you see, it's only the map of Arunachal. So all these red, red, uh, red lines you see are the rivers, all eight tributaries. So it's tributary of the Brahma or Brahmaputra. So it, it's uh, Yarlung Sangpo in China, comes down to Arunachal, flows to Assam and goes to Brahmaputra. So this is uh, the river system. If you, the blue is the Brahmaputra, it's one of the world's largest river basins. Like it's like, it's impossible to even think that dams could you know, sustain in this river ecosystem. So, so uh, and then if you look at the Diban Valley where I come from and where, which I'm trying to advocate for, uh, it's also India's, uh, you know, Arunachal has 86% forest cover of India. I mean, the whole Northeast area. And then uh, 0 0.39, 
percent of India's total area, the Bang River Basin has. You know, these endemic and very important species. So the ones you see on the screen to the top left um, is the Mishmi Takin, which is uh, only which is endemic to only like higher altitude regions like Bhutan and uh, China. It's only found in these areas, and even these Asiatic golden cats. So these are some camera trappings. Uh, uh, put by the community members. So the community is trying to take a lead into do conservation themselves instead of giving it to more like, you know, like, uh, let's say, ecological scientific conservation groups, right? Because they also lobby a lot into uh, displacing the locals. So, I mean, you might, as, you might as well take it on us that, you know, we take it. So, uh, if you see the data, it's 555. So this uh, 555 species of bird, 41 species of fish, 381 species of butterfly, etc. It's only in Italian area, which is, if you see, look at the map, Dibang Valley is at the top right. It's only there. It's, it's one small village, the, uh, the submergence. It's only there you have these species. Imagine what's there in the entire region. And it's still being like, it's still a scientific curiosity to go out there and research because it's very rich in biodiversity hotspot. So, I mean, you can imagine what, what we are losing here without even having a report. So, I mean, the government made a report, WII, World Life Institute of India, made a false report. So they gave, like, you know, some African birds existing, and then they, they completely denied there are tigers. So, you know, so these these reports, so our mechanism is also one of the democracy's mechanisms also to work with the scientists and the academicians, you know, journalists, our scientists, artists, to produce these data. So the next slide, please. So challenges, let's, let's get down to challenges. If you look at this map, so it's a satellite image our scientists produced last night. So, uh, so it's very recent. So if you see, uh, tremors were felt of earthquake in Thailand also. But that, if you see the red dot here, that's where the Bang Valley is. So it's highly seismic zone, like one of the oldest, like, so 8.6 magnitude uh, earthquake was uh, happened there in 1950, which uh, killed half of the population. So also the, uh, you know, um, the cultural and uh, what do you say, uh, the demographic uh, of the Bang Valley is very interesting because the population is barely 20,000. Uh, to the latest census, it's barely 20,000 people there. And it's one of the largest districts of Arunachal Pradesh. So, you know, resistance, even if you say mass movement out of 20,000, in Dibang Valley alone, it's only 8,000 people. So, like, how do we gather people? Even if there's 400 people, that's still a lot of people for the community. But that is not counted in the governance, you know, as mass movement democratic protest. You're supposed to have 10,000 people. Well, we don't have that much kind of people. You know, like, so, and then... So these are some really like burning issues that's our, that are on ground and we've been advocating it forever. So we, and I learned it from this, uh, attending the UN conferences only that, you know, there are two types of voluntary and mandatory you know, uh, working in organization, but we are solely voluntary. It's not an organization, it's collective of scientists, sociologists, myself, uh, artists, including. So we do it uh, voluntarily, but then what's happening is that we really have to, so what the, what's happening is that we really have to, you know, uh, be vigilant all the time because, and also really like self-regulate our funds. So those are like some core issues we face, but then, uh, but the challenges that are uh, fundamental to our purpose is also that, you know, Northeast India, the whole this region you see, it's all highly seismic area, highly, highly seismic area. So this red road you see, it's the 1950 earthquake was uh, in Dibang Valley only. 8.6 magnitude. And then just yesterday also, there was another earthquake of 4.6 magnitude. So, you know, so these things keep happening. And this is a very fresh data. I just procured it out of our scientists, one of our scientists, Chintu Shed, you can ask okay. the link there. So, and then when you look at it, 60,000 megawatts we propose in the entire Northeast region, out of which 50,000 propose, yeah? Yeah, kindly wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just like, really like, sorry. Uh, how sorry. Much time <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. So, uh, you know, only 50,000 proposed in Arunachal Pradesh. So 170 dams proposed in our uh, state alone. 
So what we are looking at is the violation of Sedimon Tribes and other traditional forest dwelling acts, which is under the Indian constitution, you know, right to dissent, uh, fundamental right to life and livelihood, uh, freedom of speech and expression. I was also, uh, you know, almost arrested. Uh, my friends were arrested. So, so all this is happening. And if you look at IPCC, it's violated completely. No, and also no free prior informed consent. So, okay, we can move to the next slide. But I also wanted to add that there are like draconian laws like Oxpa, which can, you know, um, the whole region can be militarized and people can be killed or just on the basis of doubt, not evidence. So if you look okay. at this again, this, uh, this is recent flood in Assam downstream. So when we yeah. look at uh, uh, downstream, so only a 10, for 10, 10 kilometers is considered according to Indian government. But then if you look at it, this mass, mass displacement and every year it's flooding, every year. So if you even just look at Assam flood, it's, it's like very evident. Just Google Assam flood, you know what's happening on ground. And then the transnational issues like Bangladesh and India. So Bangladesh and India, it's also interesting because they signed a treaty between the, each country independently, the, uh, the Ganges Treaty, that said, you know, our river Ganga will not pollute your uh, Bangladesh because you are downstream. But nothing has happened between uh, India and uh, Bangladesh in terms of Brahmaputra, which is the world's largest river basin. Also, okay. nothing between India and China because uh, China essentially controls all the dams upstream in Tibet in the glacier. Yeah. So that is the actual res reservoir. Of Thank you. Thank you, Banu. Uh, okay, could you? Okay. So, yes. Uh, we'll share your PowerPoint presentation okay. uh, to the participants. And thank you for highlighting you know, the increase of we will, indigenous I people. Think, uh, have, I think the last point I want to really... People have been uh, opposing construction of mega dams for a long time because we know that it, it has a very big impact to indigenous communities. Now with the shift to renewable energy, again, this construction of hydropower dams are, are coming in. And the shift, the discussion on the shift to renewable energy is that, again, rights-based. And this is where indigenous peoples are saying that you have to recognize, respect, and protect our rights because it, it will again lead to a lot of human rights violations, not just the hydropower, but also the mining of transition minerals for electric vehicles. So thank you, Banu. Now we move on to the last uh, case for, for Bangladesh. This time it's a case mm -hmm. on tourism affecting uh, indigenous communities there. Um, can you play the video, Ivan? for Bangladesh. Muru people are the second largest community living in Bandarban. In Chimbukhil, they are the largest in number, but most of their land are being grabbed in the name of military community, military training center, in the name of tourism and other development. For the example, in Shwalok, in 2006, about 11,549 acres land there being grabbed in the name of the establishment of military training camp there. So about 8,000 of Muru community people from 10 to 11 villages, they have to be evicted from their places and they started living on Chimbuk Hills. But in Chimbuk Hills, in the name of tourism, the land of Muru people are being grabbed again, like the Nilgiri. Because of this Nilgiri, about 123 families land here being lost. Similarly, in the current case of the five-star luxurious hotel establishment issues on Naito Hill, it also uh, began to grab the land. In the name of this five-star hotel, about 1,000 acre of land were planning to be grabbed by the uh, military army welfare trust and Shikdar company and the Marriott International. So to defend their land, more people uh, started a movement peacefully to arrange this protest. Um, we submitted memorandum and we arranged a uh, human chain, cultural showdown and long march. The most significant issues of this protest is our women leader and community women members, they were actively uh, participating in this. 
in our experiences, the leaders or the organizers were being targeted by the law enforcement and others. So as, as a strategy, our community women, they came forward and they started to actively participate in this. They went from door to door, especially before the long march, before the arrangements of long march. The women leader, they went door to door, village to village to spread information and to make the whole community convinced to stand against this land grabbing. And especially the young women of Muru community people, they worked very hard. So the current situation of Nathan Hill is not that much improved because the land still are being grabbed and and the community they we are determined that we will not give up our cannot our life cannot be destroyed our traditional way of living our traditional occupation everything is being lost because of this land grabbing so we are determined and we are very much lucky and we are very much strong because our community members, women leader and the youth women leader, we all are together and the leaders of the women especially, they are standing with us and we all are actively doing this protest. <clears throat> uh, as you uh, heard, he's one of the uh, organizers of the movement uh, against establishing the five-star hotel by the Shigda Group, Army Welfare Trust, and also Medio International. So when we learn about this uh, case and community was peacefully, they were protesting at the initial stage, they were submitting memorandum, they were uh, arranging human chain and later they staged a cultural showdown just to bring the case in the national media. So later, uh, we learned that uh, actually at the very beginning, uh, the government, government and the local uh, hill district council actually given only 20 acres of land for the purpose of a, a rubber plantation. But the other group involved, they actually encroached more than as the, he mentioned about the 1,000 acre of land they are planning because within the 20, 20 acre of land, you cannot uh, uh, establish amusement park and also cable car, uh, uh, luxurious villas, five-star hotel. You cannot accommodate all these things in, within only, only 20, kilo, 20 acres of land. So their hidden agenda was to uh, encroach and grab huge amount of land, the, the traditional land of indigenous Muro people. And, <clears throat> That's why they were uh, protesting. They, they have communicated with the National Human Rights Commission and other mainstream uh, human rights organizations. They even, for the first time of their life, indigenous Muro people traveled to the capital, Dhaka, to submit the memorandum to the prime minister and to <clears throat> talk with the media. So they tried every possible things from their behalf uh, to uh, stop. Uh, this land grabbing and establishment of the private hotel. And, <clears throat> but till now, uh, we also uh, communicated with the uh, UN special mandate holders and five special mandate holders together, they should statement not to implement uh, this private star hotel project in you know, Moro people's land. And still now, we didn't uh, heard that the authority had canceled this project. But still, there is a temporary military camp set up there and they cordon that area. So uh, indigenous people are still uh, in fear that if this project has been implemented, then their livelihood, the traditional occupation will be hampered. Previously, as as in this, the, the organizers in a video he mentioned, um, previously there was also another tourist spot then there is called the Nilgiri tourist spot. Even that tourist spot also uh, hampered the livelihood of indigenous Muro people. Uh, because in they, these indigenous groups, they live in the top of the hills. And for their daily living, for their daily use, the water source they use is very limited. And even that uh, tourism groups, tourism or tourist uh, complex authority, they, 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 they grab the 
the the the water source of the Moro people. So again, if this five-star hotel project is being implemented, they again face the water crisis in their uh, in their in their land. On the other hand, there is no epic before uh, uh, leasing out this the original land of Moro people uh, to different companies. So the the authorities should have uh, arranged consultation or. Uh, some kinds of discussion and they should obtain the uh, consent of the community, but they didn't do all these things. And the similarly, actually I, I was about to share some of the, another case yesterday, but I didn't get the time. But that one is another the adjacent uh, sub-district near, near the Five Star Hotel is, is a Lama rubber plantation. So that uh, uh, land of indigenous Moro people also leads out to the rubber, Lama Rubber comp Company. And again, the same, following the same strategy, uh, they were given uh, 50 acres of land, but they are encroaching and growing more than 1,000 acres of, acre of land. And to do that, what the company did, at the very beginning, they, they just set fire up the orchard ground of the indigenous Moro people and the Tripura people. So then they just created some uh, terror to make them forcefully evict from, from, from their land. But the indigenous people, they protested strongly. And, but the second time, when they set fire, people didn't uh, go away from their place. And again, what they did, uh, they just put poison on the uh, they are only water source. Mm. So this is one kind of killing, uh, killing the people and they are forcing people to evict from their place. So we bring this, uh, this issue at the national media. We stage huge demonstration in the capital and at the local level also. So uh, this type of uh, Criminalization, criminalization by the rubber company. Uh, we we highlighted all these things, but but for an um, we don't know the we we bring all these things in the knowledge of media, in the knowledge of administration. But the rubber the rubber company authorities still they are living free. But on the other hand, the rubber company against frame false cases against the indigenous people, indigenous activists who were defending their rights. So this is the another case. And I'm, uh, but finally, what I would like to say, uh, our government all the time, they at, the, at different forum, they always highlight that they are uh, respecting or respecting the rights of uh, uh, ethnic minority people. They are arranging, arranging all kinds of uh, arrangement from government side. But even at the latest uh, eight five year plan, this is the government plan. Yeah, the pension government will implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And also, go, they will uh, ratify the ILO Convention 169 because our government already ratified ILO Convention 107 for Indigenous people. But they, these are only in their words, not in action. Okay. And finally, what I want to say. Uh, there, one of one of our professor from Dhaka University, he has written one book, Political Economy of Unpeopling of Indigenous Peoples, in case of Bangladesh. And through that, right, he wanted to, but state and non-state actors create create some such kinds of environment. They just want to finish Indigenous people. They don't. They don't. Uh, uh, recognize the exist existence of indigenous people. So they are arranging this type of uh, environment where indigenous peoples are uh, vanishing from their existence. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Pana. Now our last, I hope it's okay that we extend a bit for 10 minutes. Um, our last speaker, we are happy to have here with us uh, Georgina Lloyd of the United Nations Environment uh, Program. Now, having heard, <laughs> having heard the stories from the ground, no, we would we'd like to know the work also of, of UNEP in relation to um, 
environmental human rights defenders and how will this be uh, how how is this for indigenous people who are defending their lands and the resources thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to join this side event um as you uh, may be aware that UNEP was established as the first UN agency with a specific mandate to protect the environment, to lead the environmental agenda within the UN system. And the mandate around environmental law also includes issues around core procedural rights of access to information, public participation, access to justice and environmental matters protection of environmental human rights defenders and advancing environmental rights is a fundamental part of this mandate of, of UNEP. And we need to be very clear that protecting human rights supports protection of the environment. And you have all demonstrated that so clearly with the stories and the struggles of all of the indigenous communities across the region. UNEP must uphold environmental rights and support women and recognizing the rights of indigenous communities and of environmental human rights defenders. The way that UNEP can support the work of environmental human rights defenders is through the Environmental Rights Initiative. And this is a coalition of both state and non-state actors that seek to protect, promote, and respect environmental rights. We work with civil society and we try to create enabling environments for states to progress um, their their responsibilities as duty bearers. So there are three main pillars. One of those is enhancing protection of environmental human rights defenders and, and expanding and protecting civic space, as well as integrating the right to a healthy environment within UN processes. And I'm sure you're aware of the UNGA resolution from July of this year that recognizes And, 18. and through this policy, UNEP can support uh, protection of individuals and groups who are defending their environmental rights. The policy comprises a response mechanism, and it's not widely known um, that UNEP has this mechanism. There is an email address, which is unep-defenders at un.org, through which submissions can be made, communities and individuals uh, whose environmental rights are being violated or are at risk of being violated can contact UNEP directly and in confidence. And through this mechanism, UNEP can respond to credible reports of violations in conjunction with civil society partners and OHCHR, as well as um, the, the mandate holders uh, and, and look at ways to denounce attacks, torture, intimidation, criminalization, uh, and murder of environmental defenders, uh, request government and account company accountability for certain events. So we under can undertake joint advocacy with OHCHR. We have released statements for Cambodia, for Vietnam, um, and we're, look we're exploring some other countries where we're going to be putting out some statements together with OHCHR denouncing government intimidation against uh, environmental human rights defenders. Um, there is more that we can do, of course. Um, we need to really support the protection of civic space um, and implementing the UN um, principles for the protection and promotion of civic space and try and work more closely with the UN agencies on the ground to get them to also advocate more vocally for the rights of Indigenous peoples and, and the work that women Indigenous environmental human rights defenders are, are undertaking. Um, so maybe I leave it there. We do have a few resources um, that I'm sure you're aware of, but I can maybe through Joy to put them in the chat box. 
um, and, and we can share those. And I'll also share the link for the response mechanism yeah. that we have. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Georgina, even for the last minute invitation. And, and we look forward to um, stronger partnership with the UN, especially with the policy that you have and the response mechanism on how it could uh, also help in addressing concerns of indigenous peoples in relation to uh, human rights violations. We have a number of we have a number of questions here. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> time, time is against us, much as we want to answer, but kindly for four participants in Zoom, kindly send your emails and um, our speakers will be responding to them through email. I would just also want to mention that for support for uh, indigenous Human Rights Defenders, IPRI, Indigenous People's Rights International, has this legal defense fund where they can support indigenous peoples in struggle. Um, information on that will be uh, will be provided in the chat box uh, link. I know there's one hand raised to, to ask a question, but we, we're, we're running over time now. And Unfortunately, we can't <laughs> accommodate. <laughs> but um, Peter, is that a very burning question? Peter is from Kent. Hmm? Peter is from Kent. Peter, Peter Kiplangat, your hand is raised. Yeah, go ahead. Unmute. Can you unmute? Hello, Peter. Okay, go ahead. Yes, hello, everyone. I, I am Peter Kiplangat. I'm the executive director for the Ecosystem for Social uh, Economic Development Organization in Kenya, working for the indigenous Ogiek people uh, in southwestern Mao. Um, uh, thank you very much for the various presentation that has been done by, um, among others, uh, uh, the, the presenter from Indonesia. Uh, I've been a big advocate for the indigenous people rights. Uh, I remember I had visited the Bushmen of the Botswana uh, with one of my former colleagues sometimes back in 2006, uh, trying to agitate for their rights over land rights. And in fact, even we were arrested because after doing some fact finding mission of the exactly human rights violation to the indigenous people, it's good to expose the key items the human rights violation as per the human uh, human rights law and yeah. then you expose them to the media you bring you have a press conference and you expose uh, to all media within that country the issue is to make a fact finding mission for instance to Bots uh, to indonesia okay. meet the community get the real facts so that you you run with the facts to agitate for their rights and finally the uh, for what happened in Botswana, even though we were arrested and released, the justice came to the people of the Bushmen of Botswana, and they they were finally their issue of land rights was sorted. The same happened okay. to, uh, to my visit to the uh, the, the hunter gatherers of the Hadzabe people in Tanzania. Sometimes in 2010, I visited there, did the con uh, conduct uh, fact finding mission expose yeah. the government of, of Tanzania on the human rights violation. And finally, the, 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 the government responded and uh, the issues were addressed. So it is how we are organized as indigenous people, how we yes. call for the information so that we relate the human rights violation, what is happening there <laughs> with the law, which, which law Extend. of the human rights that protects those people. Like, for instance, the right to prior informed consent. Uh, there is the issue of ILO Convention 169 about recognition and identity. The, there are also other channels using the Office of the Special Rapporteur of the Human yes. Rights of the yes. to pass the information of the human rights violation. It is okay. very important that we are organized. We can be few, but we can bring change in our society. What we yes. need is just 
justice for the people in Indonesia and other indigenous people who are facing similar violation is only yeah. how we can get organized and exposed through advocacy way the human yeah. rights violation and seek justice for those people thank you very much uh, my email for those who want to get in touch with me is african ogiek i think i've typed in the search is african ogiek at gmail.com and i like what the unep is doing but uh, i need unep to do to make more effort to ensure in africa Oh, uh, uh, to make sure that it works closely with indigenous activities. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And yes, it's true that what we're experiencing here in Asia is also happening in Africa and also in Latin America and other regions where indigenous peoples are. And we need solidarity with each other. We need to support each other's struggles and be one in organizing our communities, coming together, unite together for the defense of our land and our life. Because the defense of our land and our life as indigenous peoples is for the future generations also of indigenous peoples. And we hope that through the initiatives of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, the work of the UNEP, it could somehow support you know, these challenges that we are facing in our communities. Um, Thank you very much for attending this side event. Thank you to our interpreters and to the speakers. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. And we stand in solidarity with you. And we hope that we all continue doing the work in, in, in not only saving the environment, no, but protecting, uh, protecting the resources and the land for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes.